Well, good afternoon. I'm uh, Lieutenant General Retired Jim Dubik. I'm your AUSA um, advertisement to start this uh, conference off. Uh, thank you for joining us for this contemporary military forum entitled Transforming Land Power to Meet Global Challenges. We certainly have, I think, the best panel of the day to talk about this. As your professional association, the United States Association of the United States Army, is proud to provide forums like this uh, throughout the year that broaden the professional knowledge base of our professionals and those who support the Army. AUSA will amplify the Army's narrative to audiences inside the Army and to help further the Association's missions to be the voice of the Army outside. Of course, we don't do this alone. This uh, AUSA relies on its members to help tell the Army's story and to help support our soldiers and families. A strong membership base, therefore, is vitally important for our advocacy to the Congress, in the Pentagon, defense industries, the public, in communities across the country, and in the 122 chapters across the country. If you're a member, great, thank you. If you're not, uh, move out right now and go join. <laughs> uh, just one administrative announcement before we start the panel. Uh, because of the uh, current environment, we've had to reduce the capacity in each of these uh, forums. So if you leave the room for some reason, please uh, know that you may or may not be able to get back in as we're attending uh, the numbers outside. So with that, I turn uh, the panel over to Francis Rose, our moderator, and I welcome all the panel members on behalf of the USA. Good to see you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate uh, the warm welcome, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, I'm really happy to be back in person. Uh, I missed seeing everyone last year. I'm a rookie compared to a lot of you, I imagine. This is my sixth AUSA. And so uh, I always enjoy coming and seeing familiar faces and meeting new folks. Um, the uh, discussion at hand is tremendously important. I will not bore you with the headlines that I'm sure you have already followed that uh, uh, make the implications of what we're discussing here clear. Transforming land power to meet global challenges. I want to welcome my fellow panelists, uh, General Christopher Cavoli, General Charles Flynn, uh, Vikram Singh, Corey Shockey, and Mackenzie Eaglin uh, directly to my left. Uh, we have uh, plenty of time for each of them to uh, give some thoughts to begin the conversation. Uh, I will then, I have a few things that I've scribbled down and I'll, uh, that I want to uh, ask them about and then I hope to set aside a fair amount of time for you to be involved too. We have the microphones that you see and uh, there will be plenty of opportunity. So as you're thinking about um, what you're hearing, I welcome you to jot them down or remember those thoughts and, and pose them to the members of the panel. Uh, without further ado, I'll start with General Cavoli. Welcome and thank you very much for participating and uh, please take it away. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Appreciate it very much. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for the invitation to be on this panel. It's uh, wonderful to be on a panel with such uh, distinguished colleagues and uh, it's good to see so many friendly faces in the audience to include Andy Knight, who I just saw for the first time in more than a year, one of my favorite soldiers and artillerymen who was so good we gave him command of an infantry company when he was a, a young officer. So it's good to be here. I, I've been in command of U.S. Army Europe for uh, the last three and a half years. As many of you know, in the past year, we um, combined it with U.S. Army Africa and uh, my headquarters adopted the Africa portfolio as well. But today I'd like just to dwell on U.S. Army Europe for a moment and, and the efforts we've been taking there. So the most recent um, uh, national defense strategy named adversaries, uh, uh, not a very common thing, um, but one that gave us a great deal of focus. That focus built on the focus that we had started to generate in the wake of 2008 and 2014. Um, the annexation of Crimea and um, the incursion into eastern Ukraine. And uh, essentially, I think the big top line message from U.S. Army Europe is we have been and are preparing, training, organizing, training, and equipping 
for large-scale ground combat operations uh, as a method of deterrence, but also because we deter by being prepared to win. Um, so the history of U.S. Army Europe, as many of you know, started the Cold War. Um, huge fraction of the U.S. Army was located for deployed inside Europe. Um, over time after the Cold War, we drew that down until finally in 2013, the last U.S. tanks left the European continent soon thereafter. Um, uh, uh, the events of 2014 <coughs> transpired. We began to reverse that first with rotational organizations and armor brigade combat team rotating heel to toe uh, through Europe since 2015. Later, a combat aviation brigade in addition to that and a division headquarters minus. So that was rotational forces were the U.S.'s first attempt to thicken our stance there. But in the past couple of years, we've had significant targeted very specifically targeted, but significant growth. First of all, um, the 41st Fires Brigade, a rocket launcher brigade consisting of two launcher battalions stationed in Grafenwehr, Germany, up and running, fully operationally capable as of February of this year, a huge addition to our combat power uh, on the continent of Europe. Second, we uh, created one of the Army's first active component short-range air defense battalions, the 5th of the 4th Air Defense Artillery. It's located in Ansbach and a couple of other locations in, in Europe. Very importantly, the Army reestablished the U.S. 5th Corps and aligned it against the European problems that Lieutenant John, General John Kolaszewski may be in this room right now. There he is, John Kolaszewski. Uh, is the commander of 5th Corps, uh, just finished his uh, final certification exercise to declare operational capability in only a year after being established at Fort Knox. So a huge feat on the part of Mike Garrett's Forces Command and John, you personally. Um, that operational layer of command and control will add immeasurably to our ability to prepare uh, uh, for operations on the continent. And most recently, we activated the first, uh, the Army's second multi-domain task force. It'll be headquartered in uh, Mainz Castell, Germany, just south of my headquarters. And finally, next month, we're gonna activate the Theater Fires Command, the 56th Fires Brigade. All of that together will significantly thicken our ability to manage competition, but more importantly, to on-ramp large forces to keep the theater set for the conduct of large-scale operations. Um, in addition to this growth, we have had a significant amount of modernization. Um, we're about to begin the um, A2 upgrade to our multiple launch rocket systems. We have received the Army's first four striker vehicle-based short-range air defense systems. They are uh, up and running now in Germany. Uh, we have fielded terrestrial electronic warfare systems across our force, and we have um, uh, had some innovative new Department of the Army aerial collection systems put into the theater that we are, we are uh, working to integrate into the larger UCOM collection system. That's our structure. More important is our activity, I believe. We have returned to large-scale exercises on the continent, and every year we make them just a little bit bigger, but more important, just a little bit more complex. Um, these exercises go by a variety of different names. The Signal One has been Defender Series for the last two and a half years. Um, but what they really bring is multi-core enabled, reinforced from the con contiguous 48 states, operations. So uh, when we came out of the Cold War, we essentially turned the European theater from a forward posture theater into a reinforcement theater. And so our ability to practice that reinforcement and to enable that reinforcement and to integrate it with our allies to conduct large-scale ground operations is fundamental to our, our existence and our future success here. In that regard, I would like to call out Major General James Smith. Raise your hand there, James, please. James Smith commands the 21st Theater Sustainment Command, which is the backbone of the reception staging onward movement system that we have inside Europe. And Joe Hilbert commands the 7th Army Training Command, and he performs the integration function. So we have been rehearsing at micro scale and at macro scale this reception of a reinforcement, integration, and then operations with our allies across the entire uh, theater. In this regard, we're quite similar to uh, U.S. Army Pacific. We have great challenges with time and distance. 
We have great challenges with integration of large organizations on the fly, moving directly into operations. And then finally, um, we have one big difference, a lot of water, a lot of land, so I'll pass it to Charlie Flynn. Look Great, right. Look Thanks, forward to your questions Chris. and comments. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, capitalize on a number of things that Chris uh, laid out. Frank, thank you uh, and the panel for, uh, for doing this and to AUSA. And it is good to see a lot of uh, friends. So I'll sort of frame this uh, this way, I'll talk about the place, I'll talk about the, uh, the adversaries, uh, I'll talk about some of the adversary capabilities, and then I'll sort of wrap up my uh, comments uh, similarly to outlining what we uh, have in the theater, what we're bringing to the theater, and what we intend to do with those capabilities in the theater. So the place, um, obviously uh, uh, Asia, the Asian continent, uh, the connection to Eurasia, uh, and as uh, Chris mentioned, lots of water, lots of air when you look at the map, but there is also a lot of people there. Six out of 10 today, seven out of 10 in the next decade, and those people compete largely for water, food, and power, minerals to run uh, their countries and factories and energy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of, a number of destabilizing activities that are going on in the region uh, along the Mekong River um, uh, with uh, damming, uh, a lot of challenges in places like Miramar uh, along the line of actual control of India. And I could go through a number of uh, incidents there, what I call the sort of refer to as the soft land underbelly of China from Vietnam to India or into uh, Pakistan. So that's one set. There's a whole ho uh, another host of challenges out in Oceania and the reach that uh, some countries are, uh, are uh, probing into. And then, of course, um, I think as many of you know, there's lots of challenges going on in the East, South China Sea, Taiwan Straits, off the coast of Japan. And then, of course, the uh, actor on, in North Korea and all the uh, actions that they bring. Um, Russia is also an actor in the region. Um, so we've got the, the range of, uh, of adversaries that are uh, involved, not just in the, um, in the Pacific Ocean area, the Indian Ocean area, but also up in the Arctic. I often refer to the Arctic Circle as uh, Russia is in the Arctic Circle looking out and China is outside the Arctic Circle looking in and attempting to move there. So that's quick summary of the place. Lots of things going on, lots of challenges, and I can go in more if you've got uh, questions on it. So adversaries, I mentioned a few of them there. I'll just say that uh, the uh, A2AD arsenal that uh, um, China has built is uh, in many ways um, designed to attack our, uh, our air and naval uh, assets. So I think what land power can do is enable some of those activities uh, and some of those capabilities that we want to maintain by having a uh, terrestrial-based force with a wide range of sensors to be able to see, sense, understand the environment and the conditions that we're uh, confronted with out there and the complexities uh, that go really from the west coast of the continental United States all the way into Eurasia. Um, so, you know, the, 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 uh, the adversary and uh, the capabilities uh, that they're presenting to the joint force create challenges for us, but I do think that, uh, again, some of the things that General Cavoli mentioned here with uh, capabilities that uh, the Army has brought to bear in Europe were attempted to do a number of those things in the Pacific as well, just to name a few. So the first multi-domain task force is established at Joint Base lewis McCord, has been for nearly two years, um, and the uh, 5th Security Force Assistance Brigade, which is established at Joint Base lewis McCord, now in 10 countries uh, in the region and operating. Um, they're co-located with uh, first Special Forces Group, uh, part of United States SOCOM, but an enabling capability that uh, is part of the land uh, power and the land domain extension into the region. And then, of course, uh, the capabilities that reside 
uh, in Hawaii itself and Alaska, these three power projection platforms that we use to generate uh, readiness and put that readiness in the region. In Hawaii alone, including the Hawaii Army National Guard, there's 10 flag officer uh, headquarters. Uh, one of them is commanded by uh, Major General Dave Wilson, sitting right behind uh, the uh, sustainment commander from Europe. So again, the theater opening, theater distribution, theater sustainment, uh, largely the glue that binds uh, the joint force together is done often through what I refer to as the foundational capabilities that only the Army provides the Joint Force Commander, from civil affairs to medical to sustainment, integrated air missile defense, military police activities, uh, Corps of Engineers, again, I could go contracting, I could go on and on, but these, these capabilities that are at the theater Army level are really to enable all of the Joint Force to operate uh, with freedom of maneuver, freedom of action, and be able to capitalize on some of the uh, situations that happen day to day in competition. And I'll say that uh, from, from the West Coast to Alaska to Hawaii, to the forces that we have forward in Japan and Korea, obviously in, in, uh, in my AOR, the, uh, the, the posture that we have um, in the northern, what I refer to as the northern corridor of the region, is pretty strong and has been strong for the better part of 70 years from South Korea to Japan to Hawaii, Alaska, and the West Coast. Where we are trying to do some unique things is in the southeast, west, and central corridor of the region. And uh, again, uh, I think Chris described quite well what they're doing with um, Defender Europe. This past year, uh, we had a similar operation called uh, Defender uh, Pacific. In the future will continue to operate and call it uh, Operation Pathways, different from Defender in Europe. And I would just say that the combined effects of having an operation and an exercise go on between Cobra Gold in, uh, in Thailand, Garuda Shield in Indonesia, Orient Shield in Japan, Talisman Sabre in Australia, Balakatan in the Philippines, and then some experimental operations that were going on with Army Futures Command between Guam, Tinian, Saipan, and Palau. Over the better part of about three months, we want to continue to do those types of operations uh, because the amount of readiness that we get by operating in the region, in the conditions, uh, and in the environment where we are most likely to be uh, gaining, uh, uh, increasing our joint readiness, uh, increasing confidence uh, in what our allies and partners need from us and expect from us, and then uh, by way of denying key terrain from the PRC or any other adversary that is trying to uh, fracture or destabilize uh, the uh, vast populations that have to live out there and have to live, um, um, you know, and, and, and continue to, to get along with one another uh, because of the competitive nature of uh, things that are happening, whether it's in uh, technology or whether it's in uh, power, water, and food, as I was talking about earlier, for the which really is generated out of the global commons. So anyways, all that to say, I look forward to uh, your questions. I hope that gave you a, a little bit of sense of, uh, of uh, the place, the capabilities, or the adversaries and the uh, adversaries' capabilities. And, so what uh, the theater army is uh, is doing uh, i look forward to your questions thanks general thank you very much both generals thank you very much um mr singh why don't you become uh take the first uh civilian position respond either to what the general said or or let us know what uh, you brought with you to for us to think about okay great francis thanks so much and uh gentlemen i hope i'm there's a nice sign up here saying, pull the mics close and speak directly into them. So we'll try to do that across the board. Thanks, uh, thanks gentlemen, for, um, uh, for your remarks and for all you guys are doing and all your, your, your men and women in uniform are doing uh, to try to pivot to uh, really what is a new era of great power competition. I, mean, I, I know it gets thrown around a lot um, that you know, we're, we're at this, this moment of change, um, but essentially uh, what we're facing in Europe and what we're facing in the Pacific um, really are uh, the potential for major 
power adversaries uh, to, to shift our strategic reality uh, in a way that would affect many generations of Americans, would affect our national interests, not just in some abstract way, but actually our ability to be secure and be prosperous going, going, going forward. If, you know, if China really does reorder the Asia Pacific, or if Russia really does succeed, you know, not just in um, dominating Eastern Europe, but really in managing to fragment NATO um, and, and, and sort of exploit what we're seeing as weaknesses in democratic societies um, all around the world. Those, those opportunities are, are, are viewed from Beijing and Moscow as, as real pivotal 21st century opportunities for them to change their fundamental position. Their fundamental position has been as major but not uh, great global superpowers, major powers but not superpowers. And, and for, for Russia, it's about getting back for China, in a way, it's about getting back its stature, something that the Chinese have taken deeply to heart about being, uh, you know, about being uh, mistreated and, 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 and held down and disrespected for, uh, you know, a century. It's about regaining that power. But it's also about displacing or at least becoming a, a, a true peer with the United States. And, um, you know, Russia probably doesn't have the prospect of really doing that. China may have the prospect of really doing that. But in both cases, the challenge is not that they're trying to meet some, uh, you know, this peaceful rise that you hear from China. It's not that they're trying to just meet their aspirations. It's that part of the way they want to meet those aspirations is going to potentially make the world a much more dangerous place and, and make the world uh, truly hostile to the kind of uh, future we in the West and in Western democracies want to see. Right. So I think that one of the questions becomes, OK, what does warfare look like? What does it look like if it goes bad? Right. And I think there's a tendency right now to focus in Asia on maritime and air and in in with regards to Russia and Asia, with regards to Europe and Asia on, you know, the sort of the, the critical future aspects of, of, of conflict, which is what I focus on myself, actually. Technology, cyber, information capabilities, um, a lot of gray zone and hybrid, uh, hybrid warfare um, issues. But what you need to remember is, um, when it comes to deterrence and when it comes to fighting and winning if we end up in conflict, land power is absolutely essential. And I think it's easy to, it's easy to get distracted and think it's not. And we're fortunate that General Cavoli, General Flynn, and their, and their men and women in uniform are staying highly focused on what it looks like to be effective at deterring and to be prepared to fight and win if you end up in a full-scale conflict. Um, those things are fully tied together. If the adversary, the, be that Beijing or, or be that to be the Russians or the Chinese, that's who I'm focused on, um, if they don't really believe that we are willing and able to actually deploy land forces in a conflict, our deterrence is fundamentally weakened. I, I, in fact, I think I would go so far as to say I don't know that um, that deterrence really holds up in a situation where you don't believe your adversary is willing to actually deploy forces on the ground. It's it's really hard to see. It stays too abstract. So while wars get fought in all theater, all domains, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you're fighting for your your towns, your cities, your people, your population, you're fighting for what's, what's on the ground. And so the Army is at a moment of having to figure out how it fits into and supports this new era of conflict. Peacetime conflict, the information operations, the cyber operations, financial uh, tools that are being used to, uh, to, to, to fragment and weaken societies, um, irregular tr things we've always called irregular threats, whether that's trafficking in arms or narcotics or terrorism, 
all of those things are part of uh, you know what's going to be a different picture if you look at look at conflict in the future, and the and the and the and the army has a critical a critical role across the board. Just look at our recent challenges, um, COVID. Who's been critical to the COVID fight across the board? Um, you know, natural disaster responses, uh, CT terrorism threats across any theater, whether you're talking Africa, whether you're talking Asia, um, the, you're, you, you see the, the, the role that the Army and ground forces play in general. Uh, NEOs, uh, just look at Afghanistan right now. And Marines, 82nd Airborne, you know, required to make that happen, even though it is the, the it was gray tails flying in and out that got most of the video coverage. Um, it's, um, it's deployed US Marines that took the casualties. And so at the end of the land forces remain absolutely vital. And I think that one of the, 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 the shift needs to be to developing the technologies, developing the capability in areas like cyber, developing the capability in areas like sensors, sense, you know, being able to help us have operational understanding of the environment we're going into. Um, and then almost forgotten, but something that uh, especially, I think Charlie, you really touched on, um, the enabling relationships, right? So these alliance, our alliance partnerships, our, um, our security assistance, what you know is building partnership capacity. Um, it's almost an un. It's almost it's it's almost a, a, a uh, intangible uh, in the big picture. People sitting up and looking across from the from from sixty thousand feet are uh, so, sometimes miss the importance of all the exercises we're doing of increasing the complexity of that activity of building the fabric of those relationships. A huge amount of that. Uh, happens obviously across all the services, but a huge amount of it is is uh, is army to army. A huge amount of it is uh, a common, you know, it's what it's what FAOs do. It's what um, it's what happens when we do large scale maneuver uh, exercises with you know army to army. It's what happens when we do joint exercising training, um, and it's what happens in the classroom education that we offer, the, the IMAT programs that we offer. Um, and it's important to remember that while we think air, air and maritime an awful lot, especially in Asia, and I'm an Asia guy, that's my, my focus is China and China's influence in the region, um, we have a lot of army-centric partners. Now, we may feel that that's not exactly the best, that maybe they are imbalanced, uh, you know, take, take in Indonesia, take in India, um, you know, are really critical partners in the region. Most of these countries, most of these countries, and China itself actually, are fairly army focused in how they've structured themselves for national defense. And so it's important to go to where your partners are. And those relationships, those army army to relationships, um, are really critical. So, you know, in sum, I just I think that um, I think that we uh, we are at a point of shifting our attention and our resources. We have a lot of very hard choices to make uh, from an investment standpoint. Obviously, we need new and novel technologies across the board. Obviously, there are air, maritime, space, cyber capabilities that have to be invested in. Um, and I think one of the key things is how integrating across our planning and integrating across the joint force so that we don't end up making redundant investments across the services or leaving gaps unfilled um, is going to be extremely critical. Um, but, uh, you know, make no mistake, um, where, go, where the Army goes, so goes our ability to deter and prevail in conflicts in both these theaters. Uh, really uh, look forward to the conversation. Thanks, guys. Vikram, thanks very much. Dr. Corey Shockey is next. And I have done enough of these with you in the past to know <laughs> that while your prepared remarks, I'm sure, are quite instructive, I would be very curious to know what you have been very actively scribbling in that book. So I invite you to dispense with those remarks and just share with us what you've scribbled in the book, if you would. 
Uh, because, because no, that's not fair. Frank and I are friends. He is very nicely giving me a get out of jail free card for not having prepared remarks and giving me just the fun of responding to what I'm hearing. So I thank you for that, my friend. Um, I owe you a drink. I'll take it. I was um, struck listening to General Cavoli that um, you had actually nothing to say about Africa, which is Given the nature of Chinese moves uh, in Africa, I thought was striking. And it, it strikes me that that may be a useful fingerprint about what we need to push ourselves to think anew about. For example, that the Army's mission in Europe is large-scale reinforcement from the United States strikes me as actually the wrong mission. Um, because there is no place in the world where the United States has more capable allies in larger numbers and with more direct interest and more direct focus similar to our focus. And uh, I think if General Eisenhower were here, he would be astonished that we still have troops stationed in Europe. Uh, this long after uh, the end of the Cold War. And I'm not arguing against the stationing of US troops in Europe. I favor it very strongly. But I do think our major mission in Europe should be orchestrating other armies into the fight, not orchestrating our own from the continental United States or any place else. Um, and that might be worth some more thought. A second thing is you come as a force provider to other theaters uh, because I'm, I think, perhaps more confident than General Cavoli about the strength of deterrence uh, for a major ground war in Europe. And I'm, I think, a little bit less confident um, about the need uh, about our ability to flow forces either from Europe and not just American forces, right? Because we're going to need to be the mobility for lots of other people's forces should they choose to join us in fights um, in Africa or in Asia. Um, I was heartened to hear General Flynn's uh, discussion about the Army as an enabler for joint operations throughout the expanse of Asia. That strikes me as, as the right kind of uh, focus. And also, the Army's day-to-day, -day, in and out engagement with forces in the region. Because it's going to be a really hard slog to align countries in Asia into thinking about China the way we are worried about China. And especially if you know, the, the test becomes the defense of Taiwan. Our advantage strategically um, is our operational burden, which is getting everybody else lined up on our side uh, and moving forward with us. And that's a whole lot of day-to-day -day hand holding. As Vikram said, being worried about problems that other people are worried about instead of the problems that we are worried about, because most militaries would love to have the problems you all spend your time worrying about instead of the problems they have to spend their time worrying about. Um, which makes me happy that it sounds like uh, the new defense strategy in the works, or the new national security strategy in the works, will dispense with great power competition as the frame of reference because that actually plays to China's advantage. This notion that you know, they're a rising great power and we're Sparta, a declining great power, facing Athens in their fulgency. And that's actually not what we're doing. It's us and just about everybody else having agreed on a set of rules about for example, how uh, ships on the ocean, o open ocean behave. And the Chinese wanting to unilaterally change those rules to their advantage and the disadvantage of everyone else. 
So every time we talk about great power competition, which I grant you is a useful way for us to organize ourselves, which is to say, finally, finally, people, prioritize, as Mackenzie Eaglin <laughs> keeps telling us we need to do, um, and focus on China. Um, but that's actually not a useful way to talk about it with everybody else, because it will make the very cooperation we need harder to get from those countries. Um, uh, there is a beautiful little pamphlet that I encourage for your thinking about these problems. It was written by an army lieutenant colonel named of Red Reader in uh, 1941 or 42. General Marshall sent him to the Pacific, understanding, of course, that once the army had won the war in Europe, we didn't have a force large enough that we wouldn't have to swing it to also win the war in the Pacific. Uh, which goes to uh, the point that I think all three speakers made, that, um, uh, that we're not going to have the luxury of optimizing just to one set of challenges. We don't have a big enough military now. We didn't have a big enough military in 1942. And so the pamphlet that Lieutenant Colonel Reeder writes, Marshall sends him to interview all of the Marine commanders in the Pacific to figure out what they had done wrong and what they figured out how to do right so that the army could actually train soldiers while you were swinging from Europe to the Pacific for the challenges of the Pacific because they're different kinds of wars. Uh, because obviously you have different kinds of adversaries. And if I were, um, if I were worrying about the war we would have to fight in the Pacific, it would look to me a lot like the early thinking about war in the nuclear age, namely what in the Eisenhower administration they call broken back warfare, where at first you have all of the high tech, spiffy, the, the kind of war Vikram was talking about. Um, and then all that stuff gets destroyed and you have to have grit and soldiering to carry you through when everything else is already gone. Because that's what I, in my judgment, a war with China would look like. Moreover, that's what allies need from us. Because they're not going to have the spiffiness that we have in toys we're playing with. And they may not even have a common operational picture, which means getting them into the fight is going to be a really hard part of the problem. Last couple of things. Um, we are doing a pretty good job as a government and especially as a defense establishment in gearing up for managing a broad-shouldered, aggressive, repressive China, right? We're not doing half bad about that. I went back, incidentally, not long ago and read the 2016 National Security Strategy and I was struck that it's not actually a great power competition, China strategy. Mostly that's what DOD did in the transition from the national security strategy to the national defense strategy. And it was really a nice magic trick that even I, who pay pretty close attention to this, didn't realize uh, how much more focused the NDS was than the national security strategy was on China. And, and we've done a really good job. Mackenzie will, will point out where, well, among the many things Mackenzie will do, uh, is I hope point out the necessity of greater prioritization and the budget gaps of achieving it. But it looks to me like the gears are meshing. What I think we're not thinking enough about is the problems attendant on a failing China. Because it looks to me like that's what we are already facing. So we, what is propelling China now is the momentum of a rise that has stalled, where pro-market reforms stopped happening in 2002, uh, where, you know, ask yourself, why is China making the moves they're making now? Because why not just wait till they'd won the AI race? Why not wait until the Trump administration had actually collapsed America's alliances? They're not waiting for any of that. And it, it's at least worth considering um, that they're trying to take advantage of a window of opportunity that they feel is closing. Um, and uh, 
The last thing uh, that occurs to me, listening to my military colleagues, is that we need to help um, the Biden administration understand, to a greater degree than I think the Trump administration understood, that military deployments aren't a proxy for credibility and that coming out of the policy decisions we have made in Afghanistan uh, and are likely to make in Iraq and Syria, that we actually need them to get serious about the relentless diplomacy and civilian leadership of these problems um, rather than expecting the arrival of a ship pulling into port or an exercise to be all we do in order to signal credibility. Because as I think General Cavoli started, um, deterrence is the actual game we're in. I think rather than some pointed comment, I will just say, follow that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Francis. Um, I, I, I've learned a lot actually, just being up here for the half hour so far, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that on this panel we have agreement where I don't think there is much else in DC on a couple of questions. And so uh, what do I mean by that? So I think there are several sets of big unanswered questions by civilians that the Army needs clarity on to, to, um, to continue to keep the unsteady peace, I guess, is what I would say. And while it may seem like there is agreement in Washington because of the, the remarks that we've made on this, um, there's an absence of, of clarity because I think partly these are politically hard questions. And so when you bring that element into it, it just be, it just gets, things get harder. And so what are some of the big unanswered questions? Well, when, if I'm a force planner for DOD and I look around the world, is it deterrence and competition or is it winning the war fight? Because increasing, while there is some overlap, sure, uh, the numbered plans are different than the day-to-day -day grind that the generals have to deal with. The presence, assurance, deterrence, assur dissuasion, persuasion, all the other not conflict missions that they're doing every single day around the world with just as many forces forward as at the height of the war. So what are they doing? They're doing all that other stuff. But the numbered plans are what we size and structure and build the defense department and budget the defense department around. And so, well, there's many plans, of course. Um, some are preferential. And uh, it's, it's increasingly unclear, and the overlap isn't going to be enough to get us there, right? Where you have, you know, do you want specialized forces or general purpose, and, and how much of what, which kind? Um, and if it's deterrence, as, as the, the name of the game, is it by denial or by punishment? Because uh, those are also, again, they're different solutions, different services, different risk horizons, um, or different risk appetites, and different time horizons when you're talking about how, how exactly, you know, what deterrence looks like in these problem sets. And then thinking about if it's the war fight, as opposed to the, the competition slash deterrence slash presence, what happens, I guess Corey said it pretty well, what happens, uh, what if war is just more than the giant missile exchange, which you know increasingly is what I hear around town? Uh, when that's over and the battle is not. We're not pretty good at ending wars. I think we just saw that in Afghanistan, unfortunately. You know, we don't do treaties and armistices anymore. So um, what if that doesn't end it? Then is war still uh, more than giant missile salvos and exchanges? Or is it a battle of people and wills? I think this group would agree, but in Washington, it's hard to, that costs a lot of money when we're starting to talk about people and wills. Uh, and then on the threat priority, you know, just listening to, it, it was a really good panel setup, not because we're on it, but because of the, the two generals and the two theater perspectives that they bring. Is it a three theater, four sizing construct that we're talking about? You know, basically balance of power slash, um, you know, deterrence in, Europe and Asia with an economy of force mission in the, in the Middle East? Is that, is that the 
essential you know, do job du jour of the department? And if so, we're doing it all wrong because as Corey's heard me say, that's a trillion dollar defense budget. Uh, I think it's actually what we're doing on the ground, but it's not what we say we're gonna do on, in paper and, uh, and, and in budgeting. So I'll close it out by saying, um, again, Corey said, we don't have the luxury to optimize to one challenge, amen. Uh, I agree with that, even though I'm talk calling for priorities, of course. Um, but who is doing that? The Marine Corps. The Marine Corps, that, that servant there. No, no. <laughs> They can do things that the other chiefs can't do, the commandant, uh, and get away with it. It's remarkable. Uh, so Force Design 2030, uh, you know, it's, it's lauded all over town as, as being a brilliant, you know, goring, sacred, cows, uh, forward-looking, all the right answers document. Um, and that may be true, or is it just really, really, really risky business to specialize in this luxury of one problem, one challenge, one enemy? And while you're doing that, shift burden of responsibility onto other services, namely the United States Army, for what you're giving up. Our armor, artillery, uh, rotary wing capability, specifically helicopters. So when the Marine Corps gets rid of it all, who, who's going to pick up that bill? The Army. But I didn't hear any ex brilliant exchange by civilians in Washington like making that overt choice. As far as I know, there's no agreement with the chiefs that this was the agreement. So it's just, and, and, and the commandant's moving forward. It's already happening. So what, is this, what does this tax mean on the Army? The Army's already getting taxed with you know, pandemic you know, relief and response, more climate, everything, uh, and, and additional domestic um, missions, border, housing of 60,000 Afghan refu uh, citizens and SIVs and other um, personnel at US military bases, the list goes on and on and on. And so uh, I guess I would conclude by saying, you know, that, that sounds smart, Force Design 2030. You know, people like to say, well, we never fought at the Folder Gap, Francis, but guess what we did do? We fought proxies of our enemies in World War I and, uh, in, during the Cold War everywhere else around the world in, in, in the small, messy wars. And I think we'll continue to see that in the future with, with China and with Russia, uh, but, but we're not being honest about that, I guess is what I'm saying. So, so my, my watchword is, is honesty today. Thanks. Um, I have a note, by the way. Um, you've been invited to be on a panel called The Future of the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they would very much like to hear your thoughts about what that looks like. So. I doubt they would. I, um, when I spoke to the Commandant privately recently, um, he shook my hand and said hello. I was on my panel and he shook my hand and said goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> I think that sums it up. Um, you all have used uh, uh, your opportunities to talk at some length or other about allies and partners. And I would like to start with General Cavoli and General Flynn. Uh, and, and raise a point that I think Corey might have brought up. What is the expectation in your interaction with our allies and partners, what they have regarding land power in the future from the United States? General Cavoli, you wanna go first, please? Yeah, our, our um, <clears throat> expectations derive directly from our planning efforts and um, our expectations can be measured both in terms of quantity and quality of forces available. You know. I, um, so uh, I, I have to study the actual force that's on the ground um, um, facing the NATO alliance. And um, it is a very, very significant force that cannot be assumed away or wished away. And it's proximate to the borders of the alliance in some cases and, and not that far removed in others. So there's a time and distance um, consideration that goes to the readiness, the availability, the quantity, and the quality of the allied forces that would face it. So what we actually you know, expect is, uh, probably shouldn't be discussed very much in this forum, but it's quite a bit. And, and it does rely on US um, enablement at the higher end. Um, and of course, to get it into the fight, to facilitate it into the fight, as uh, Dr. Shockey described it, requires US presence, US participation, and US leadership. 
So there's a reason forces remain on the continent, American forces remain on the continent. There's a reason we practice reinforcement because you can't wish away the force that's opposing us. It's there, it's really there. Um, and it requires a force that is capable of defeating it in its own domain as well as across multiple domains. So that's, what, that's kind of what we work on. In terms of um, um, how that plays out, um, Mr. Rose, across our um, interactions with our allies, um, we rehearse, you know, the parts we um, practice, the things we think we would have to do in a large-scale fight um, with our allies. We rehearse them uh, very frequently. I see Adam Yokes there from uh, the Polish Army. Um, we have participated together in numerous wet gap crossings, for instance, bridging operations, uh, very complicated things in which all of our forces would have to pool assets successfully to negotiate the number of obstacles um, uh, that we would face um, in operations. Um, we practice parachuting operations together for rapid contingency response to include uh, preparing to bring forces over from U U.S. Army Pacific and parachuting into our area. Um, so the things that we anticipate having to do in large-scale fight drive our interaction with our allies on exercises and our preparatory interactions with our allies are determined by what we expect to do with them on exercises. Um, so it all kind of comes together, um, you know, from IMET, as Dr. Singh talked about a moment ago, all the way through the large scale exercises uh, that we do. Everything we do in U.S. Army Europe is done with allies. In fact, it's hard for me to think of any activity we conduct that is not conducted with our with our allies, and in some cases, special partners as well. General, thanks, General Flynn. I, I, so a lot of a lot of similarities. So I won't re uh, grind a number of things that Chris mentioned. I will uh, say um, where there's a a, a binding. Um, collective security arrangement and forces uh, that, uh, as Chris described, are working day in and day out. Um, we have a little bit of a different challenge in, uh, in you know, across the Indo-Pacific. Uh, while we do have some partners that, uh, uh, you know, we have treaties and uh, obligations that we will meet, uh, there are others that are, um, uh, our work with them requires uh, to meet them, uh, I think as Dr. Shockey mentioned, to meet them forward uh, and be forward with them and seek ways to, uh, for them to identify uh, the things that they would like our help with and then conversely the things that we can learn from them. Uh, as Dr. Shockey was talking, I thought of uh, a few years back, I remember taking a Corps commander from a, a country in Southeast Asia into one of our ops centers. And uh, when we walked out, I was sort of feeling very proud about all the technology that we had there. And I said, you know, General, what did you think? And he said, I think we'll never be like that. And then we continued to walk and uh, he stopped and he pointed over to the jungle and he said, but that's not why you need us. And so I think that that was an illustration to me of the help and assistance that we can give to them because there were things um, in the command post that added value to uh, the operation that we happened to be on, but there were also things that we need to learn uh, from them. And I think that that, uh, I know that Chris's team is doing that every day. We, um, everything that we're trying to do in the Indo-Pacific is with our allies and partners, everything. Uh, and the more we, we do that, I think the more uh, confidence that they gain by, uh, by being alongside us, by learning from one another, by us reaching out to them to find out what is it that they need from us. And then, Conversely, what is it that they offer to us that we need to learn inside of our own formations because there are an enormous amount of skilled professionals out there in the region that we can benefit from. And uh, so I think, you know, in addition to what Chris is saying, uh, one other comment that uh, I wanted to uh, sort of emphasize that Chris mentioned. On the other side, um, there is 
a known adversary, multiple known adversaries. I mean, you can't discount the 10,000 tubes of artillery that are facing down uh, into South Korea. So it's there. Uh, and we, uh, while we may size for competitive activities, these, these are real numbers <laughs> with real forces, and they really could do something. And so we have this um, delicate balance that we have to walk about doing a range of competitive activities uh, that are direct and indirect um, in support of our allies and partners, but we also have to be able to execute in the event that something goes terribly wrong. And so uh, that's what I think that uh, we're faced with uh, each day and every night. And, uh, and we have to be very pragmatic about our ability to respond to that. General, and, thank and, you. And similarly, Charlie, I think uh, it, it befalls you and me to distinguish between the way we aspire to fight someday in the future and the way we have to prepare to fight with what we have right now. And those aren't necessarily the same thing. And it's easy for us in academic discussions to conflate those sometimes. So uh, we kind of are the place where you have to, where we got to unsort those two and make sure we're able to prepare for the latter while we're able currently to execute the former. General, thanks. Um, Corey, since you uh, started this discussion about what allies need from us, um, what should they expect from us? Or what should we uh, be able to contribute to them? And what is reasonable for us to expect, as General Flynn said, that's not why you need us. What should we, um, what's reasonable for us to think that we can gain from them? Uh, that's a great question. And I think the answer, like with any good question, is it depends, right? It depends on whether you have a, a defense treaty with them. Um, we In Europe, we have tried to blur the line between those countries that are NATO members and those countries that we just want to defend. Um, and the Russians have driven the cost way up to keeping that line blurry. Um, and I think we should expect adversaries in Asia to try and do the same, uh, which is why the Quad is such an interesting innovation, uh, because it does blur the line in interesting and important ways. I think AUKUS blurs the line in interesting and important ways. Um, and uh, we should, uh, it is to our advantage to have those lines blurry. But the problem is when your marker gets called in on that stuff, you actually have to be willing to do it. And I was pleasantly surprised at how far forward the Biden administration has been leaning on Taiwan, for example. Uh, but, but as General Flynn said, that's a, these are non-trivial challenges when you actually have to execute um, on them. And, and what I would want if I were an American ally is a lot less nonsense from us, right? A lot less grandiose statements, a lot more practical nuts and bolts. Under what conditions can you rely on these things? Let's codify them in war plans. Um, you can't reliably deliver the United States unless the Congress is engaged in the activity. So uh, agreements that don't have congressional ratification aren't really agreements, and that the increasing seesawing of executive orders uh, across administrations only reinforces that for allies. So what I would want from the United States is less nonsense and more practicality. What I think they have a right to expect from the United States is clarity about what we can and can't do, and honesty about, as Mackenzie was saying, honesty about what we will and won't do uh, which is a hard conversation to have, right? Because there are lots of things we may want to do that we won't do when push comes to shove. Uh, and making the best of that is, I mean, the United States is a difficult ally. We're an unreliable ally, even though that's not how we like to think about ourselves, right? We think about ourselves even in the context of World War II. 
um, as the war-winning ally. And what we looked like to the British is somebody who wouldn't show up for three and a half years. Um, and we look like that to a lot of continental Europeans, too. So I think um, less uh, chest-thumping triumphalism out of the United States and a lot more good old-fashioned strategy, which is, so Shockey's theory of strategy is that every good strategist is fundamentally a desperate paranoiac because strategists spend all their time thinking about, oh my God, what if the, a trap door opens underneath my chair and I fall into the sewer underneath this building? How did you know that we had one of those? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you don't because you would have exercised the button by now, Frank. No. Um, lastly, what I think we can expect from allies, I hated the way President Obama would always say, we can't care about it more than they do, because that, um, that rings of the arrogance of a country that's never had to face an overwhelming challenge. And we ought to ask ourselves what, you know, the people of my great home state of California would do if they were facing a 10 to 1 challenge of conquest. And we should be actually nicer and more reassuring about even if uh, we can't defend your territory from the outset, we will help you reconquer it eventually. Because that's a reassurance I would want if I were an American ally. Vic. What do you think is, uh, is the right exchange between allies and partners in the United States regarding the topic at hand of land power? Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go. I was gonna, uh, I was gonna jump in while you were Put, talking to No, so, uh, go, well, go for it. So, I, I think that um, Corey said something that I think is pretty provocative which is in, and really important, which is that we, ten, we tend to dress it up in a lot of pomp and circumstance. This, our, you know, our, you know, the alliances and they're unbreakable and they are, you know, for, you know these, these forever commitments. Um, but of course, everybody knows that alliances are not uh, forever commitments and that they are um, they're they are sometimes you know very successful they're more like marriages in a lot of ways with uh, all the work that goes into having a marriage be successful it's not just you know you're you 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 sign the treaty and now you're forevermore you know going to be there for each other um, and I and I think that what we what we have is something really uh, uniquely important, which is that we have this network of allies and partners. It is our strength. Back again to something Corey said, it's not us versus China and us versus Russia in a lot of these shaping of the 21st century. It's us and a whole bunch of other countries who kind of share a vision of what we would like the world to look like. And Russia and China having revisionist ideas to one degree or another about a lot of those things around which there's pretty broad consensus in the rest of the international community. But then what we forget is the day-to-day -day for those allies and partners looks very different. For every uh, ally and partner we have in the Asia Pacific, uh, China is an overmatch, right? China is crushes them very quickly. And so their perspective on what they can do in terms of showing spine and standing up to China and talking truth, um, that looks very different for them. For every one of the countries in ASEAN, China is their largest trading partner. For every, and for even big powers like India, you know, India's not catching up to China, guys. Like, it's not catching up on fighters, it's not catching up on submarines, it's not, ca you know. now. So, so then you start to have to look at the little things. What are the little things? The little things are how does, how does a Taiwan respond to aggression from uh, Beijing in terms of like what we've seen recently with all of the, you know, all of the aid is, in, you know, incursions. How does an India stand up to uh, a Galwan incident where it has, uh, it has soldiers killed for the first time in 45 years on its disputed land border with China? Right? How did, and then what do they, those allies and partners, how, does, how do partners in the South China Sea respond to essentially China's extension of its, um, of its dominance to the first island chain 
right, in you know South China Sea and 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 further east. How do they respond and and look to handling that? And then how do we help back up what works uh, for those allies and partners? Because one of the things you can't do to have a successful alliance is to expect more than your partners are capable of doing, right? You need to figure out how you partner effectively and play to each other's strengths. What I do think we need to expect from our allies and partners, though, you know, to you know, to to you know, to channel some of that what you were hearing from you know President Obama, and I've heard from leaders, political leaders on both ends of the spectrum, about you know getting allies to step up. I think what we need to expect from them is um, is the same kind of clarity about how they want to face these challenges. Because when you shut the door, they all agree that they don't like the coercion and the uh, you know and the pressure that's coming along with you know the BRI projects and the ability of the Chinese to to turn turn the screws on them, the willingness of the Chinese to do economic coercion, you know, like what we've seen with Australia. Um, over a long period of time now, they, they, they don't like it, but they also, you know, they know they can't count on us to, you know, essentially s save them completely. So they need to understand, like, what's the strategy for mitigating, managing, and deterring the worst possible outcomes from the assertiveness of uh, their big neighbors, who they are also so dependent on. Thanks for that. Uh, I want to give you a chance to answer Mackenzie to wrap up this part, but I want to let you know that uh, when she's finished, we're ready for questions from the audience. So if you would like to ask a question, you're welcome to go to one of the microphones and uh, we'll begin that part of the conversation. Go ahead, please. Uh, I want to go back to a comment by uh, General Kavuli, which I think was the honesty about which I'm preaching is needed, and uh, but but not enough of which is you know essentially boiled down to I'll paraphrase what you said into the first part of it is what Donald Rumsfeld said so right you go to the war with the army you have so you're going to fight it tonight with the army you have but yes we have to aspire to what changes are ahead and the force of the future so to speak um, but in this disconnected town, this Washington, it's increasingly uh, the emphasis is on, in terms of planning and programming and buying, the emphasis is on the war we want to fight in the future. And it comes at capacity of the force today. And that's the fundamental budgetary and political trade-offs that's happened now for, I'd say, the last five fiscal years. So it's not even exclusive to one administration or another. And I think that has pretty, that can have obviously pretty disastrous and dangerous outcomes because you know, the focus, for example, the fait accompli scenario with Taiwan and preventing that, but I think Russia is increasingly demonstrating capability and exercise and willingness that it could perform the fait accompli in the Baltics tonight. And we only talk in Washington about one other, one fait accompli. Uh, and so this, this willingness to take risk in the present moment for the future that doesn't ever seem to quite get here or quite fully get here is a sucker's bet. But it's the one Washington keeps taking because it sounds smarter like Force Design 2030 or like the Kill Chain or like any other pick similar argumentation. It's just, it sounds smarter. It definitely is sexier. It's cooler. Um, but when, until that Skynet, so to speak, is in hand, I'm not willing to take that risk. And so um, it's not about allies, but about kind of what were the assumptions that we project on them and, and, and I think the wrong ones that we're projecting. Thank you for that. Um, Corey, no, did you want to follow on or just no, cheering just saying, her on? I was just cheering. Excellent. Um, I want to ask General Cavoli and General Flynn, uh, you both talked about the similarities between your commands, and you touched on the differences, but I wonder if each of you would explore the differences between your commands in whatever way you would choose for a few moments, and maybe General Cavoli would go first, please. 
Um, yeah, I, I would say um, the, the first difference is um, the geographic proximity of another combatant command to the European theater, uh, specifically AFRICOM. So uh, I think it was a very big advance that we incorporated the Africa portfolio into the US Army Europe portfolio because it allows us to think in a large scale conflict. It allows us to think of the Mediterranean basis as a single theater of operations, which it basically always has been. Um, I mean, from the Punic Wars, right? So um, I, I think that's a difference. So Charlie does have other theaters, but these are land masses that are managed by different parts, different organizational structures that abut each other in, in very close proximity. So I, I think that's one difference. I think a second difference is, is the nature of um, the potential adversaries, um, uh, uh, the, the military problem it presents. In, in, in the case of Europe, there's a very big mass challenge that is proximate to our forces on land. Um, so there's not a water gap that has to be crossed. There's not, a, um, there's not an air gap that has to be crossed. But there's a continuous land mass that has two large, potentially opposing land forces. And I think, I think those are two, from a military perspective and a military technical perspective, operationally, those are very salient differences. Um, so a couple things. Um, one, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so we have a, a challenge with, you know, the practical application of forces uh, on the Korean Peninsula. And then we have another challenge with, uh, the again, the, the sort of the geometry of the geography that we have uh, in Asia in the rest of the theater. I think one other point I'd like to um, add that's a, a bit of a difference is that, um, we have to support the 13 states, territories, and possessions out to the second island chain. And that's under the Indo-PACOM commander for homeland defense and defense support to civil authority. We also have forces in Alaska that are part of Northern Command. And their defense support to civil authority and homeland defense. So uh, those, I would just say, there's, there's two combatant commands that uh, my, under my TJ flick role, we have to support because we have assigned forces in Indo-PACOM, but they're, they're, they're uh, positioned in Alaska. Um, and then uh, we have, obviously, uh, forces that uh, must be able to defend uh, the homeland out to the second island chain, and then, of course, uh, the Korean theater of operations, and then the rest of the AOR. So. Um, you now there's there's sort of four areas within the AOR that we have to be concerned about, and they have uh, different capabilities that are required for it, different response times, different adversaries on the on the on the uh, other side of the field, so to speak. Um, so that I think is a, a difference that uh, we have between uh, Chris's. Uh, challenges in, in Europe and Africa and, uh, and mine uh, across the Indo-Pacific. Charlie, I'd like, to, I'd like to underline that last one. So it, it's, uh, you know, from my perspective as a commander, um, w when I think about the additional responsibilities that Charlie has to defend U.S. territories and U.S. sovereign territory, um, that, that, that's a big difference. That, that, that's a big difference. Um, uh, and then finally, one last difference that I neglected to talk about, but is in the military sphere. Most of Europe is governed by an alliance, by, by the NATO alliance, which brings military advantages to it. You know, you have standards for procedures, you have stand technical standards and things like that. And I, you, you know, I commanded 25th ID out in the Pacific just after Charlie did. Um, 
and I'm sorry for what I did to the division. So <laughs> oh, but, um, you made it much better. Yeah. But um, uh, it, it's hard to overstate what a benefit it is to have a standing alliance that's more than you know 70 years old and, that, and where procedures and understandings have been worked out at a military, operational, and tactical level. Thank that, you. that is another very important point uh, that is not part of the fabric uh, across the Indo-Pacific. So, but the value uh, of land power out there, and again, I'm back to the beginning, I think some of those enabling capabilities that theater armies provide, they're, they're a bit of an epoxy that kind of binds the security architecture together because it's more than just uh, lethal applications. There are other tools that both Chris's Theater Army has uh, available that are both for crisis, for competition activities, but they're also there for war. Um, and I think that they, um, that, that those, that suite of capabilities that armies provide at scale and can provide a campaign quality to it uh, is important. Because it's, it's not about a period of time, it's about being able to sustain it over time so that you keep pressure and you continue to foster and build and grow and enhance these relationships that are absolutely essential as a counterweight uh, to all of the uh, com complementary, competing, and compounding <laughs> problems that the uh, adversaries are throwing at us. Generals, thank you very much for that. Tell us your name and who you're with, and then fire away. Hi, this is Megan Eckstein with Defense News. Um, I'm going to risk poking the bear by bringing up Marine Corps force design again. Um, but for the two generals, I was curious, obviously McKenzie mentioned uh, that there could be additional burden on the Army with the Marine Corps pulling out of certain mission areas. Uh, Mr. Singh also mentioned the idea of, you know, overlaps and gaps uh, between the Army and Marine Corps, and I wonder if perhaps there's an opportunity now for you guys to not have to worry about those issues and just kind of focus on the missions as you'd like to do them. So I wonder if we could just get some color for how this is playing out in your theater. Are you seeing any changes yet? And how are you coordinating with your Marine Corps counterparts just to make sure that the transition as they pull out of the missions goes smoothly? Good question. I'll hit that first, Charlie, because in our AOR, it's very simple. So, so our interaction derives from you know, our planning efforts. Uh, um, I felt no effect from that whatsoever right now. I'm in constant contact um, with the MAR for your commander about um, our planning efforts. And it, ju it just has not had any bearing yet. Um, the, the nature of our mutual activities isn't such that, um, that those force design changes are going to have that big an effect. Yeah, I, I haven't either. Um, and I, I would also say that even the things that we're doing today to prepare for the future are complementary. Uh, their MLR work and our MDT uh, uh, capabilities are, uh, they're, they're going to be helpful for one another. So in my view, um, the MAR4 pack, the SOC pack, uh, relationship between those those land capabilities um, are 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 complementary, uh, and through the uh, operations and exercises that are going on every day, I think that uh, there's there's no daylight between the things that we're working on out there. Thank you for the question. Um, we do have time for more questions. If you want to go to the microphone and uh, ask one, in the meantime. <laughs> Um, Vic, you wrote recently about technology, and, and I have this. Keeping the technological edge is no longer a foregone conclusion, but we can hold it if we focus. You talked about technology earlier in your uh, remarks. What's the intersection of the changes that land power is undergoing, we talked about here, and the technological edge that the military in general and the Army in particular wants to maintain? 
you know, some some of this is you know high tech, cutting edge tech questions, and some of it is just adaptation, sort of mid tech. But how do you use it? And so, Armenia, Azerbaijan, why why were what the what the forces they would have expected irrelevant? It wasn't something wasn't super tech. It was just drones and the creative and sort of mass use of drones to disrupt what um, one with what one force would have thought was its relatively robust land capabilities, right? So, um, what what we face right now is um, is is sort of a critical moment in the sense that we've just gotten used to since the early 1990s being, um, you know, pretty far ahead and um, in, in most technology and innovation areas. Um, and I would say we also were used to being pretty far ahead in innovating how we think about using military forces. So we, we've generally been fairly future focused and tried to think of creative new ways to, 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 uh, to, to employ our forces. So in two streams, our inventiveness and how we're going to use our forces, we've t we've tended to be very creative. I think that's that's um, that's changed dramatically uh, since the early 1990s. So in the early 2020s, um, you know, we're pretty far ahead, and we have what it takes to keep the edge in the high-end tech space that high, highly dependent on continuing to draw global talent um, and to resource uh, R and D. Uh, in ways that we have historically done and we've sort of always done in a crunch. So if you think race to the moon, we race to the moon. If you think now, I think there's a reasonable chance that we'll try to put the pedal to the metal and really invest in those things. But if we if we turn away from glo get, getting global talent, which has been critical to every technological leap that we've made, uh, we would find ourselves in real trouble. And the fact is, um, Friends and foes are closer than we realize. I mean, even the Russians in some in some areas, and certainly the Chinese, um, in areas like AI and quantum computing, are are closer than than, than we would be comfortable with. Um, you know, objects in the rearview mirror are closer than they appear. Um, but uh, but in terms of adaptation, in terms of not getting caught off guard uh, by what 20 years ago would have been, you know, the, the the famous like, oh, we, you know, our ships could be could be could be taken on by swarming Iranian little fast boats or something like that. Or there's a, well, that what does that look like now? That for land forces, that's become really critical because new uh, new technologies uh, are going to uh, going to be employed in creative ways. Um, in ways that could really affect what we thought was uh, good planning. So um, getting ahead of that is about exercising and, and wargaming and, you know, and having outside perspectives, having people come you know, and really do good you know, red on blue practice to, 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 to elicit what an adversary may do um, in an asymmetric way that we aren't yet prepared for. General Flynn. Well, I just make take a different tact and maybe Chris wants to add since he uh, he's got a, a new couple of new organizations in his uh, formations in Europe so uh, not to uh, discount the enormous value of technology um, from Vikram but I would say that one thing that I'm uh, um, I was in my last job I was aware of uh, as the 357 but it's become even more clear to me uh, being out in the Pacific now so the the uh, multi-domain task force the organization itself having the organization up for nearly two years and learning um, and exercising and getting the leaders there and getting the skill development and building a facility, all the sort of Dotmal PF integration that has to go on with an organizational adjustment. And having that in front of the capabilities that will land in the formation, say in 23, 24, 25, I think this is really important. Um, I think that we're learning and uh, discovering and succeeding and failing and doing all those things with that formation and other formations like theater fires commands and um, the uh, information effects group. 
the point I'm making is I, I think that in, in the Army's case, that having these organizations in front of the platform, technology, weapons development is a good thing. Because if the reverse were true, we would just feel the weapon, and we'd have to take a legacy organization and figure it out. Um, and I don't think that that has uh, proved well in the past. And so I think that what we're doing, and this is an area where we're sharing because Chris's uh, multi-domain task force just deployed or is beginning to stand up in, uh, in Europe. And he's got other organizations, as he mentioned in his opening remarks, that are essential to, uh, to his capabilities being forward. This is, a, this is an area that I think is uh, really important. I'm not discounting the technological development and the, and the uh, importance of that. What I am saying is I think the organizational adjustments are absolutely more important and they give us an agility in the future that we need to be working on today and pulling into our exercises and rehearsals and, um, and our own formations to learn how we're gonna do this. I agree with that last point, especially Charlie. Um, <clears throat> you know, Mr. Singh, your, your, your points about technology raise, raise something in my mind. Frequently when we talk about um, striving technologically. We reach pretty deep into the future for technologies that don't yet exist, and um, we try to plan around that, but that becomes sort of future casting where we're hoping we choose the right technology and get it right. And meanwhile, right in front of us, um, other folks are using existing medium-level technologies in innovative new ways that create a disproportionately beneficial effect for them. Uh, I think of uh, Azerbaijan during the recent Nagorno-Karabakh war with its use of loitering munitions and pretty rudimentary drones, um, not yeah. super sophisticated, medium level technology, yeah. but, uh, but very well combined. Right. Present a whole different problem set. Um, and we've seen innumerable other examples of this. The Russian Federation tends to be very good at it. Um, so when we think about technology, you know, I just think uh, we have to think deep, of course, and, and shoot far, but we also have to think of the increments of technology between here and there because they bring pretty significant changes with them as well, usually at a much better cost point. Thanks, General. Sir? Thanks. John Klein, Johnson Controls. As you shape your battle space, what role do you need installations to play and especially connected technologies on the installation to, a f to support what you're doing with the multi-domain force. Thanks. Um, so uh, a little bit, um, some, pro uh, some of the challenges that uh, uh, General Cavoli have in Europe, um, I, I, we obviously have similar ones in foreign, it gets a little harder in a foreign country. Uh, because we're obviously, you know, we've got to work uh, with, uh, with Japan and Korea on what are those protective measures we want to take uh, because we just have to work uh, with the governments to do that. I would tell you that um, in the areas where uh, the largest part, the bulk of our forces are on the West Coast and in Alaska and Hawaii, um, we're going to need um, the ability to protect our signature, uh, protect our, um, our IT backbone, um, uh, protect our networks. I mean, I'm not telling you anything that you're not already aware of, but what I would say is that the ability to, there's going to be a requirement to uh, provide capabilities that are going to uh, not be available to do things forward in the region. And I don't think all of these things are going to be solved, uh, again, by technology alone. I think what we're going to need to do is have distributed uh, points of presence for our network throughout the region. And much like the network has to be distributed with points of presence, we're also going to have to have distributed locations of materiel. And uh, I, 
I don't think this is going to require a lot of military construction. I think what it's going to require is taking the really the rainbow of agreements that we do have, because there are a wide range of agreements out there with a number of countries, and sometimes we don't even recognize the ability that we have through these agreements that are already in place uh, to do some things to better position, to better posture, to better enable uh, even the allies and partners that uh, we can have those agreements with. So I'm not of the belief that uh, that I'm, I'm, of, I'm of the belief we have to protect our power projection platforms and the locations where we are forward, but I do think a distributed uh, arrangement of materials, command and control, um, and protection of our, uh, our, our network architecture and the points of presence, presence required to uh, have operational reach uh, is where we need some help. And uh, it's, it's, it's not... Um, central sometimes in the debate, but it needs to become more and more. Again, back to my homeland problem, um, I have a similar situation that, I'm, you know, the, those are American citizens out there, and we need to protect those American citizens and be able to provide them a secure place to live, uh, work from, even though things may be um, uh, in a crisis situation. Thanks. I, I think the first thing we have to do is to recognize that bases, uh, to include our garrisons, are part of our operational infrastructure. So I previously, during some remarks, uh, made an inaccurate um, distinction between user PACS AOR and the European AOR. Um, there is one place in user PAC where two opposing forces, land forces, are in direct land uh, a contact with each other, that's on the Korean Peninsula. Similar to Europe, um, on the Korean Peninsula, the basing structure is part of the operational thought process and part of the operational arrangement. In Europe, it is also. Um, that's the first point I'd make. I think it's an important distinction. It's not something that we've always um, thought about when we think about our bases. We think about them as garrisons and communities, but in, in, in fact, they're much more than that um, once you get into a theater of operations. Um, the second thing is, you know, Dr. Shockey earlier spoke about the challenges of um, deployment and uh, reinforcement. Um, that's, that, that contested reinforcement is an important thing, um, and we're, we're not always as well prepared for it as we should be from home station across the lines of communication, and then at the ports of debarkation from there to the operational area. Those are... Um, areas where we have to treat it separately, but we have to think about con contested logistics deployment um, and onward movement from, from beginning to end. And our installations are a key part of that the whole way, all the way we harden them and protect them in every domain. Generals, thank you very much for the uh, response to that question. Um, we have about uh, 20 minutes or so left, and I think it would be useful at this point just to ask each of you if there's some point or points that you wanted the audience to take away today that you haven't had a chance to say and they haven't had a chance to ask you. So I, rather than starting at the other end, I'm going to start near me and uh, ask you to, to begin that, Mackenzie. Um, well, I, I, I want to talk about installations for a minute, actually, because they are part of power projection and often are overlooked. and. Uh, you know, installations have been a bill payer for 20 years in every budget uh, for to fund other pressing needs, which I understand why those choices are made, but increasingly money's gonna have to be poured back into installations in particular because of, partly because of the decay, but, you know, if you look at the uh, Pentagon leadership's, you know, sort of top 10 technologies list and you know what are the what are the game changing capabilities what do you often hear most about whether that's artificial intelligence big data quantum computing hypersonic weapons or directed energy all of these very different capabilities have one thing in common they need more energy and if you don't where are you going to get that energy you're going to get it from an installation or from a foreign country and so <laughs> If you're not talking about how to get more energy, then we've already lost. 
All right, Corey. Uh, so I can think of two things. Uh, the first is that is one that the Army can't do anything about, but I think ought to be shaping all of our consciousness, which is that the gap between what we say we have the ability to do and what we are actually funding in our defense budget has been growing in a hair-raising way for about 15 years. Um, and uh, the challenge for the Defense Department is how to be a team playing part of an administration when the administration is purporting the fallacy that the budget is sufficient to execute the strategy. Uh, and that's a difficult civil military challenge uh, when you're doing it in public, but it's also just a practical challenge for uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the military. So I guess the, the thing that keeps me up at night is the gap between strategy and funding. The, um, the constructive, hopefully constructive suggestion I would offer is that I've never understood why administrations allow DOD to do a national defense strategy. Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't if, if the reckless American public elected me to uh, president, I wouldn't let DOD do that because it gives Congress the way to grade the administration's homework. Does the budget actually match the strategy? Um, what, what I would love to see DOD do is instead of purporting that here is a strategy, and by the way, we need three to 5% year on year growth in GDP to execute it, Right? Like, why does the administration let DOD say, we're banking on continuous increases in spending in order to carry this out? What I'd love to see DOD do is strategies. Namely, if we have a trillion dollar defense budget, which Mackenzie Eaglin tells me is what we need to actually carry out our strategy, here's the best strategy for that. If you're going to constrain us to $740 billion a year, Here's the best strategy I can come up with to protect and advance American interests. And if you're actually gonna, I don't know, put a $40 billion, I'm pulling that as a rabbit out of my hat, a $40 billion a green energy requirement into the DOD budget because it's important to the president even if it's not important to these guys' ability to carry out their missions, uh, then here's the best strategy I can come up with. Because if those three strategies are the same strategies, they are fundamentally dishonest. Vic, I'm going to take a pause and invite you to give your conclusion here in a moment. I'm going to go to this gentleman here. Uh, just give us your name, who you're with, and go for it. Thank you. Uh, Mark Faulkner. I'm with the Institute for Defense and Business. My question concerns deterrence. And all, all five panel members have, have spoke to deterrence. Our, service component commanders from an operational perspective, they own battle space and are other subject matter experts. So my, you know, the, the importance of maritime and naval forces lately has been getting a lot of attention. And I would, I would argue more than, more than the other components. So my question really for, for our, our generals as well as our subject matter experts is, as it relates to uh, forward deployed land forces, you know, permanent forward deployed land forces, do we have it right uh, if generals could speak from a theater perspective, and then others, uh, is, is it right? Do we need more to, to be a greater deterrent, or you know, are, are large-scale joint exercises sufficient going forward? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, generals, would you like to take that one first? Uh, um, I would just <coughs> answer with the rather obvious response that we constantly evaluate that and then the decision on how much we put forward and how much we, we don't put forward depends on an awful lot of things, um, some of which are non-military in, in nature, you know, as considerations. Um, the second thing I'd point out is it, it is important when we think about forward, um, forward posture to distinguish between, like, in my case, on the other side of the Atlantic, or did you have something more specific in mind? Because once you get onto the continent, the more specific you get, 
the more bound you become to a particularly imagined um, uh, adversary course of action, right? So you've got to, the art of it is to be far enough forward to be responsive, but not so far forward to be committed to a single uh, a possibility. Um, so there's a balance in there, just as there's an, a, a balance in the decision to do forward posture in the first place. The last point I'd make with regard to forward posture and deterrence is, it is possible to posture too much forward and to become provocative and to destabilize your deterrence. Um, and, and therefore the calibration of how much f power is how far forward and, and, and in what level of readiness it's maintained is all part of the deterrent question in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would uh, add on the readiness part that Chris mentioned about because um, we do have to calibrate it. Uh, there are, I, I mentioned materials that, that could be an element that we have in distributed locations. I think one of the important parts, and this was actually what I was going to say in, in the closing, is that um, when we're forward, uh, then the, the joint training and the joint readiness and the joint and coalition and or ally and partner confidence that's gained by being forward has an element of deterrent, deterrence in it. And uh, I think that that's sometimes it's it's kind of uh, maybe overlooked a little bit in uh, in posture discussions because people talk more about hard things uh, than some of the sort of off access uh, intangibles that you gain by having capabilities forward, uh, exercising forward, rehearsing forward, um, uh, understanding the culture, the road networks, the bridges, just all, all of that learning that goes on by American soldier, sailor, airmen, and Marines, in addition to the allies and partners that we're operating for. That, uh, in and of itself, I think has an enormous deterrent value, and it can be from the small to the large, as Chris was pointing out, right? It's, a, it's not a one-for-one one kind of thing. It can be a different equation that can solve some of that calculus. Subject matter, oh, you, you are I, itching. Can I add one point to that? So that um, uh, during the Eisenhower administration, I think it's in the 1956 debates over the basic national security policy, the chief of staff of the army brings up that uh, we need to be flowing forces to Europe if a crisis over Berlin actually occurs and Eisenhower actually says he should be impeached if he was flowing American forces to Europe in a Berlin crisis because the army would be needed to restore order in Baltimore after the nuclear exchange. Which tells you, every, right, like that tells you his commitment to Berlin, uh, which is it doesn't matter if forces are in theater uh, because we're going to go all the way up the escalation ladder for the defense of Berlin. Most American presidents can't pull off that party trick, have that much credibility with that little stuff forward. And so what forward stationing of forces does, in addition to all of the great operational advantages, is it plants the flag that we are actually going to fight for this territory. And that matters hugely. I'm not a big fan of deterrence by punishment because I don't think it actually deters nearly as well as having the ability to do what you say you're going to do. Um, and so uh, I think we should actually have a big enough army to have forward deployed forces in places we actually intend to defend. Mackenzie? Bravo. <laughs> uh, that, that was well said. I, I, I'm not going to say anything. All right. Vic, why don't you answer the question and then you can uh, give us any other thoughts that you have to share. Uh, great, thanks uh, Francis for leading us through all of this. Uh, it's, been, it's been a real pleasure. I, I'm, a, I'm, I, I'm right there with Corey on, uh, I, think, I think, you know, you can, people see our global posture as somewhat, sometimes as, a, uh, as, as something that's anachronistic. Um, the fact is, We've left the places we've lost, and we've stayed in the places we've won. And I um, and I actually think that suggests that going, being in places that we care about, 
has more of a signaling effect than we might realize. And so I think the thing to look at on posture is, is it the right amount in the right places? Are we, is it the right forces in the right places? Um, and they have, and it has, and it, obviously it has a practical element, which is what both are, um, both, both generals were referring to, which is it's, it's about, you know, what we need to be able to do with those partners, right? So it's about the day-to-day -day work. But, um, but thinking through that, uh, the, the, the value of the skin in the game, I think is, is really high. Um, and, uh, and it, and it, and it, you know, so I would, I would, ne I would definitely not advocate, you know, bringing people home. I didn't like it when we brought people home from Europe, uh, you know, a decade, a decade ago, I, th I thought we should leave people, leave, leave a lot of those, uh, those units in place. Um, it's also, uh, it's also really cost effective, um, which is something if you do Asia a lot and you look at, uh, either, you know, just Japan and Korea, or you look at, uh, you know, rotating forces to Darwin when we were, I, that was on my, that was on my watch doing those negotiations. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's good for us from an operational standpoint. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot to be said for that. Um, you know, on the technology front, I, I, in, in closing, the things I would, the things I would flag and uh, General Cavoli mentioned, I, I mentioned the Azerbaijan situation as well, like these low, you know, these like mid-level adaptations. Um, we need to think, uh, we need to focus on, our, on the creativity. The thing that's gonna keep us ahead are things like, um, okay, you, you know, we've been trying to secure our networks forever. Well, there's a good effort underway right now to look at what about data-centric uh, security. What about what about using encryption and other tools that we are know and have uh, advanced on quite a bit to have things flow out and be able to be more network agnostic, um, but be secured and only be accessible to the right people in the right places. Um, and there's there's a, there's a made there's a good effort underway right now to look at that. That would be critical for allies and partners. Imagine if the the thing you needed to send knew that it was a secret rel Canada thing, and that somebody in Canada could look at it, but somebody else somewhere else couldn't, right? This is, this is not, um, that, that kind of stuff's not science fiction. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a great company um, uh, that's involved in those efforts right now that has already figured out how to, I won't name it so I'm not plugging somebody, but, the, but has already figured out like how to do real-time encryption of video with those kinds of attributes. Uh, at creation, so video is born, it's transmitted, it can only be looked at by people that it's supposed to be looked at. These kinds of things are like shifting how we think from securing our perimeter in terms of networks, uh, which has proven very difficult, to saying let's make the things within the network secure. If we can get there, um, our ability to work with allies and partners is boosted and our overall security, all of a sudden something could be transmitted um, you know, more, more agnostic to which system it's it's resting on. That's I, know, I noticed my G6 wasn't in the room when you said that, Vikram. So I'm, I'm <laughs> too bad. <laughs> um, you know, another <laughs> Joe, Joe. Sorry, man. Oh, good. It was a joke. Get right on it. All right, they can they can put you in touch. The uh, the the you know uh, there's other there's uh, there's other things we were talking about installations earlier. I mean, again. There's a lot of commercial technologies out there right now that are that are that that would that transform how you do installation security for other people. That the, the, where the, where the building knows who's in the building, where the badges know you know what direction people are going, where you know you know there's a there's a there's a far greater ability and much more portable security. There's a lot of things happening that we could that we could grab onto, and for for land forces in particular. At the end of the day, land forces have to operate in the contested territory, like physically there. They're not flying over it. They're not sailing near it. They're in it. And so figuring out how to operate more securely in more contested, complicated environments, that's got to be a, 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 just a fundamental focus of how we keep our keep land power capabilities relevant and effective going forward. Gentlemen, before uh, you get, say your closing remarks, one more question from the audience. Thank you, sir, for your patience. Well, th th thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Colonel Alvaro I'm the military attaché from Spain. 
And I would like to know uh, your views on the uh, possibility of uh, uh, cooperation or coordination between uh, Russia and China in their uh, competition uh, against the US, uh, particularly in, the, in Africa where, where the force posture is not so, so strong. Thank you. It's a terrific question. And you, Corey, I, I'm glad I'm not in between you and the microphone <laughs> or I would be physically harmed. Uh, so I think we too often look at singular potential adversaries and don't worry enough about cooperation among potential adversaries. And uh, even if there is a long-term reason to believe the Russians will bridle at being, you know, um, mar a marginal small support to China's power, they have really strong common interests in wanting to break up the existing order uh, and wanting to create um, payment vehicles that are outside the dollar zone, right? The petro yuan and the way that the Russians are playing around with crypto to try and prevent um, sanctions from being able to bite them. They have uh, a lot of common interests in, for example, uh, containing Japan's burgeoning power and activism in the region. They uh, could stumble over conflicting interests in Central Asia, but that's a long time coming. And the, the problems we imagined them having with each other when we were imagining this 15 years ago was the demographic boom of China moving into the empty cent uh, Central Asia and into the Russian East. And now that has collapsed. So mostly strategic failures are failures of imagination. And I agree with you that we don't, we aren't exercising enough imagination about what their cooperation could mean. One other point, though, there's a scholar at Stanford University, also associated with AEI, Oriana Schuyler Mastro, who is doing very detailed research on the kinds of specific military cooperation they have going and the degree of interconnectedness it portends. Um, so it's a really good source for making um, for making serious judgments about the degree of cooperation and what it could mean. Um, with all due respect to Vic and Mackenzie, for the purpose of time, I'm going to defer to the generals and invite you to either close General Flynn or answer the question from uh, the last questioner. Uh, I'll just uh, wrap up by saying thanks. I appreciate the uh, discussion, uh, and I'm thankful for uh, all of you and your interest in uh, the challenges that we have. So, thank, thank you. General Cavoli. Um, first, Colonel, with regard to your question, um, uh, uh, some, sometimes it might be better for me in uniform not to consider too much about what, will they cooperate, will they not, but just to observe that clearly the action of one could produce opportunities for the other. And would the other have the agility and the ability to take advantage of that opportunity. That's what I have to think about. So, so that might be one way to look at it. Um, with regard to closing comments, um, one thing that we didn't get a chance to touch on, but I would like to briefly, is um, the question of interoperability. And I bring it up because many panel members have raised the um, point that our allies are our strength. Our allies are a source of strength. Our allies can substitute, complement, um, um, work with our forces in many, many cases. Um, I think this is very important, but it really works best when we have a certain level of interoperability together so that we can function at a military technical leather level together. Um, we divide interoperability into three categories, right? Human interoperability procedural interoperability and technical interoperability. I would like to focus on the undervalued first one, human interoperability. We undervalue it sometimes because it's squishy and it's subjective and it's not as easy as saying, my radio does not talk to your radio, we have a technical problem, or you do this differently than I do, we have a procedural problem. But in fact, it is really, I think, both in both of our theaters, human interoperability, cognitive 
commonality is really the thing that will allow us to bridge gaps in the other two domains of interoperability. And in that regard, I would like, hey, Charlie, would you stand up and introduce your deputy, please? Thank you. Uh, John, would you stand up and introduce your deputy? John Kulishevsky, Commander of Fifth Corps, and my deputy commanding general is Adam Yost, Major General Adam Yost, who's in Cole, and he is F4 These are just two small examples all over the world and all over the United States. We have officers from close allies serving side by side with us, and we have our officers and their formations serving side by side with them. And I just saw both of you sitting there, and I wanted to call attention to the um, important fact that you're not just in our Army, you're also at AUSA. Thank you very much. I, I'm gonna take advantage on that. So I have a deputy from uh, Australia. Uh, actually, interestingly enough, the chief of the Australian Army today was the first deputy in the United States Army exactly. uh, Pacific Command, Rick Burr. Um, there's a New Zealand deputy in the division that Chris and I uh, commanded formally, and then we have a Canadian deputy uh, at both uh, First Corps in, um, in uh, Washington State and a Canadian deputy in uh, United States Army Alaska. So again, another illustration um, that Chris pointed out, and I, I couldn't agree with him more about the, uh, the human interoperability. And actually, uh, with the pandemic, it's even more important that we get that and regain that with some of the separation that occurred naturally because of the pandemic. So thanks. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, joining this conversation today. Grateful for your time. Uh, thanks to AUSA. It is wonderful to be back in person. And uh, thanks to all of you for your attention.